strategies we know that can increase immunization uptake. I have no conflicts of interest uh, to uh, discuss, but I do have a serious bias. I believe vaccines are safe, that they're effective, and serious diseases can occur if you're not immunized. I've particularly phrased this in this way, and you're going to understand why when I'm finished this talk, I hope. Um, first of all, let's look at what the definition of vaccine hesitancy is. This is not a new problem. This has been around since Jenner invented smallpox vaccine more than a couple of hundred years ago. This is the WHO definition. Vaccine hesitancy refers to the delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccines despite availability of vaccine services. It's complex and it's context specific and it varies across time and place and vaccine. It's not the same for every vaccine and it's influenced by such factors as complacency. I've got a lot more things on my plate as a mother than thinking about bringing you to get immunized because there's no vaccine preventable diseases in my community. Convenience, how easy is it for me to get access to the vaccine? And confidence, do I trust the healthcare worker? Do I trust my government program? Do I trust the immunization program? This is a problem in high, middle, and low income countries. Before I slip off this slide, I wanna point, oops, uh, I wanna point uh, out one thing. We, among those who accept vaccines, there are those who still have doubts about vaccine, even though they accept, okay? So it doesn't mean that you're only hesitant because you didn't accept. You could still be accepting and still have some hesitancy. This is data we've just finished analyzing. We looked at the top three reasons for hesitancy around the globe on the WHO UNICEF Joint Reporting Forum for the last four years from 2004, 15, 16, and 17. And when you look at this data, a couple of things. First of all, the most common reason countries report for vaccine hesitancy is risk benefit scientific evidence. In other words, families have concern about the vaccine. They don't trust the vaccine and the information that we're talking about. But even that reason, which is number one, it represented less than 30% of all the responses that were put in by the 180 some countries who responded to the JRF on that particular question. So it isn't that this is the reason, period. Uh-uh, uh-uh. There were 70% other reasons, okay? Second major reason is religion, culture, gender, and socioeconomic. And we're seeing more of this over these four years than we had seen in 2014. What is decreasing is concerns about knowledge and awareness. There's a lot more knowledge and awareness about vaccines out there, and it's not a lack of knowledge as much as it was in 2014. The other point I wanna emphasize here, of the 180, I think it was 84 countries who responded to this question, there was no hesitancy reported in 13 countries out of the 194 in 2016, and only seven countries this past year. So this is a common problem, folks. We're all in this mess together. Now, before we get on to looking at how we can fix some of the issues around hesitancy, I want to remind you about something, and it's called assimilation bias. All of us do it. I don't care who you are. I do it. You do it. We all do it. And parents and people in the general public do this. If I tell you something that agrees with your beliefs, you hear me. If I tell you something that does not agree with your beliefs, you don't hear me. Think of Donald Trump, okay? He'll, he's a good example. Now, what we have to do is reshape those facts we want people to hear and wrap them in a way that they can hear them, okay? So risk perceptions are often intuitive, they're automatic, and they're unconscious. Emotions play a big role in how people make decisions. So if they are anxious when they're making this decision, they're not gonna be able to hear the same things if they are not anxious. And emotions also play a role in how well people hear numbers and statistics when you talk to them. So vaccine hesitancy is influenced by many social, cultural, demographic, and social psychological factors. We're strongly influenced by what we think others around us are doing or expecting us to do, our social networks. We see causation in coincidences, and we see what we believe 
rather than believing what we see and hear. We prefer anecdotes and stories to data and evidence, and we pay more attention to negative information than we do to positive information. So I'm going to talk about framing in a minute. It matters how you frame. We may not trust the health system or the government, and trust is key to whether people will accept vaccines or not. And often people think natural infection is better, and they trust it more than they do immunization. Well, I'm telling you, natural polio is not such a good thing. So I'm not going to go into all of these pieces because we don't have time. But I want you to understand that fake news, social media, and those Russian trolls we have out there now that are doing both sides of the story are trying to stir up controversy. Science illiteracy, social clustering of anti-vaccine households. I don't mean necessarily physically social clustering, but they're social clustering on social media. Lack of perception of the importance of community immunity, the belief that natural infection is way better than and causes good immunity, and that's what we should be going for. They don't know that if you get tetanus, it's not good enough to immunize you, and you could get tetanus again. Um, and they lack any memory of vaccine-preventable diseases. They don't know people who had polio. They don't know people who had diphtheria. So I'm now going to run through 12 examples of some of the things you can do to address hesitancy. There are a lot of meat I'm going to put in here, and I don't have time to go through any one of these in particular, and there is no silver bullet. There's no one strategy that works for everybody who has hesitancy, and what we need to be doing is putting together within our immunization programs an armamentarium of strategies that we're going to use to address hesitancy. So the reason, the first one is, everybody's not the same. You have to detect and address vaccine-hesitant subgroups in your immunization program. So the reason for hesitancies vary. They may change over time. They're not the same for every vaccine. And they may be clustered in one particular community geographically or a social media connected community. The key is to identify those subgroups with low immunization and figure out who they are. That's quite hard in a lot of countries if you don't have an immunization registry because you don't know who you're missing. You only know who you've got. And it, what we want to know is who you're missing. The WHO Euro has a guide to tailoring immunization program called TIP. And there is now this has now been tested in evidence-based review. And it really does work. And I would refer you to that to show. Just wanted to emphasize here, this is Birmingham, UK, a city. We're not even talking a province or a state or a region. And there's a big difference in the uptake of HPV vaccine, whether you lived in the north end of uh, Birmingham, in the east end of Birmingham, or in the heart of Birmingham. It matters. It does cluster, and there are differences. Secondly, you need to ensure that every healthcare worker really uses best immunization practices. And a healthcare worker's own immunization status reflects on how well patients are going to be, their patients are going to be immunized. This has been shown over and over and over again in high, middle, and low-income countries. And for optimal outcome, parents and patients need to hear from all healthcare workers the same story. If a pediatric surgeon comes out and says, I think vaccines are rubbish, and then the nurse says, I think you should be immunized, the poor patient doesn't know who to believe. So we need to not just be working with the people that are in the immunization program, but everybody, all the healthcare workers in our system. And there's a lot of data now looking at HPV vaccine, for example, increased uptake in the US military when they did specific HPV education for the healthcare workers that were working in the US military. We know that many motivational interviews, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, when you educate pediatric residents, also increases uptake among the patients that they're looking after. And a study just came out very recently showing that family medicine, family docs, when they're giving CME, they randomize them to either get a CME on influenza vaccine or not, invited by email. They had to go in and go in online and do it, but they did go in online and do it, and those who did it had a, a much higher rate of influenza vaccine uptake in their patients than the ones who had been randomized not to be invited to do it. So CME does work for this. Multiple dimensions, it's better if you use many different strategies than you use a single strategy. 
And as I said, oops, and as I said before, you need to target the population that you're going after. And it's not just about increasing knowledge and awareness. It's not just a knowledge dump. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. And now I'm going to go through some of these other areas of things that we know work to increase uptake. So first of all, religion and vaccines. People hold religion up as a major reason why a family is not getting immunized. But at Grabenstein, and if you haven't seen this paper, please go get it out and put it into your armamentarium. He did a review of all the major religions in the world, and all of them support caring for others, preserving life, and having a duty to the community. They actually support immunization. The only ones that did not support immunization were the Christian scientists. And actually, when you go into the Christian scientist literature now, they're actually saying it's sort of OK if you want to be immunized. It's up to you to make the decision, OK? It's not as negative as it used to be. Um, they did not, he did not actually look at the anthroposophical group because it's not exactly a religion, but it's great. They've just come out with a thing a couple of years ago to say, vaccine will not be harmful if subsequent to vaccination, a person receives a spiritual education. So you can offset the negative value of being immunized. You can get all the protection if you get spiritual culture afterwards. Don't you just love it? Okay. Next point I want to make is ease of access to immunization really, really, really matters. You need to look at your immunization program and make sure the hours and the sites of where you're providing immunization really work for the people that you're trying to reach. This is just some school uh, program data from uh, Australia and the UK. You can see what their uptake rates are. The US doesn't use a school program, and they're up at 43%, about half of what you're seeing in the other ones. Why? Because it means mommy or daddy's got to make an appointment, mommy or daddy's got to take the kid to get it, as opposed to you're already at school, here's your arm, let's do it, after you've got the consent. School-based programs really simplify immunization for adolescents. Now, we need to be thinking about what you can do about simplifying immunization for infants and young children. Where are they? Could we be providing more immunization programs if we went to a daycare, for example, for hard to reach young children where their families are working? Are there ways we can make this better and easier? We know that bundling vaccines with other uh, offerings really helps. We know that you need to have standing orders if they're inside the healthcare system. We know that access in different sites matters. This was a study in the UK and one in the US to show that school-based flu vaccine programs were way better than if it was just in pharmacies or GP offices in both sites. And pharmacies are actually better often than GP offices because we visit pharmacies more than we do family doctors or your own clinic, okay? How many of you go to a doctor every two weeks? Well, in the province where I live in Nova Scotia, we have 1 million people and we have 28 million pharmacy visits a year. You go to your pharmacy, whether it's to pick up shampoo or a drug. So that's where we need to be getting a lot of people for immunization. Reminders do make a difference. These little nudges, sending you an email, making a phone call, a letter that reminds you makes a difference, not just in young infants and adolescents, but also in seniors. I hate to tell you, but a lot of seniors do have cell phones and they do know how to use them. And there's a couple of recent studies, albeit it's in high income countries, to show that when seniors were asked about pneumococcal vaccine on an email that they got, more than 80% of them opened that email, looked at the video that was there, and it increased substantially the number who came in to then get pneumococcal vaccine. A systematic review for pregnancy showed that among the strategies that can improve uptake, again, are reminders to, preg uh, to pregnant women that they need to be immunized. It's only high-income data, country data, unfortunately. Mandatory immunization and incentives. I could have spent the whole talk on this. There's a couple of, we wrote an article that came out in vaccine a couple of months ago, and there's one that just came out this past week in high income countries. Again, if you want to look at it. But a couple of points I want to talk about here are what do you mean by mandatory? This is a very complex area. There's soft mandatory where, yes, but you have, if you don't want to get it, you can write a letter and not get it, you know, get a, a, a waiver for it for philosophical reasons. Or it could be hard mandatory. You're not allowed in school or into daycare unless you're immunized. Or I'm going to fine you if you're not immunized. Or I'm going to put you in jail if you're not immunized. Pick your country. And, 
Uh, there's other ones where um, they uh, have denied uh, people their child tax benefits or credits if they're not immunized. Now, one of the problems with this is there's unintended consequences and there's some ethical issues too. So in Australia, the no jab, no pay mandatory excludes you from services if you don't get immunized. There was a slight increase in uptake when they did this, up 0.94%, which is not nothing. Okay, but it's not huge. But the government saved over $500 million. Where'd they save that money from? The lowest income sector, who were not the people that were hesitant. They had other barriers to immunization, okay? They were the ones who were not getting the child tax credits now. So in the group they were actually going after, it didn't actually get them. Only 20% of the 80% they were going after actually was this an incentive for them. So be careful when you do something like this that you think about what you're going to do and follow up and see. But overall, mandatory generally works, but there's actually only high income country data on this. There's no good studies on middle and low income countries. And beware that it might backfire on you. In Poland in 2018 with their mandatory, they had marches in the street against it. Okay, so be careful when you're going to put something like this in to be sure you've thought it through. Effective communication. Knowledge doesn't mean action. I can tell you this because all of you know you should have done your 30 minutes of aggressive cardio this morning before you came to the meeting, and I bet all of you didn't do that. So knowledge is not enough to just make us do what we're supposed to do. And knowledge is important, but it doesn't always change behavior. Be proactive, not just reactive. Pay attention to what the media is saying and what the reports are in your, in your media things. Remember, this is a two-way conversation. Ensure that you are listening to what people's concerns are and are trying to address it. Choose the knowledge you're going to focus on. It varies with the target group you're going after. If it's about infant vaccine, that's very different than if you want seniors immunized against pneumococcal vaccine, with pneumococcal vaccine. Make sure that your healthcare workers' communication is being done, not just community communication, and ensure that it's fit for purpose and evaluate and test it. And information needs to change over time. People get bored with the same messages and they stop listening. So the mantra should be, you need to communicate, communicate, and communicate some more, but make sure that it fits the audience you're trying to target and have a crisis communication plan in place when everything starts to go wrong. And there's a lovely uh, oops, uh, WHO Euro web template uh, that you can go and look at, and here's the reference for that. It's really very good. You need to be monitoring and using media. You need to be tracking trends to see what's going on. And there are a lot of places that are starting to do this with really quite good effect. This is Italy looking at the changes in print stories about vaccines and how this changed. This is all around their new mandatory vaccine. Be creative, evaluate. There's a smartphone app that I thought was very cute. Um, the app gives you reward points and incentives if you get flu vaccines so that you get cheaper shampoo in the pharmacy. It's kind of cute, you know? You just, so think creatively. Think about who your target audience is and what might appeal to them. This is a really important slide, and I probably wish I could have spent the whole talk on this one. This is work that's come out of Cambridge University, not Cambridge Analytics, okay? Um, Van der Linden is the leader of the group at Cambridge University, and he's done a lot of work on climate change and belief about climate change. And he did some work on immunization, and we know that highlighting consensus of medical scientists increases public support for vaccines. So you standing up and saying that you do believe in vaccines, you think they are safe and effective, blah, 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 is really important. We all need to be standing up and saying that. What do you do if false information is presented? Well, with climate change, you can confer attitudinal resistance. You can inoculate somebody against false information by telling them they're going to hear this false information, and these are the strategies that are going to be used. Can anybody tell me the five strategies that are used by the anti-vaxxers? Um, it's really easy. Think of Trump again. Conspiracy, fake experts, selectivity in what information you're going to present, has to be 100% effective and safe, and misrepresentation and false logic. Trump is a past master at the latter. Okay, 
So we don't have similar studies about what has worked with climate change, but we think it's going to be similar. Again, WHO has a how to respond to vocal vaccine deniers in public, and it has a step-by-step -step algorithm to go through to exactly what you should be doing if you have to stand up in public with an anti-vaxxer and you have to decide if you're going to do it and so on and so forth and you can find that document there. Those techniques have now been used and tested and there'll be a paper coming out I hope in the next, I don't know, six months um, that will give you the evidence for that this really does work. Now, we need to shape children's beliefs. Remember we talked about the beliefs at the beginning? We want to get in there and shape those beliefs for both children and adolescents. So we need to be doing education programs in schools around immunization in elementary and in high schools. Denmark, uh, in Copenhagen, is developing a curriculum. And in Canada and Ontario, by 2020, there's a vaccine education program that's going to have to be in all schools across the province of Ontario. I'm emphasizing this, Kids Boost Immunity. You can find it online. It's a quiz. You go in and you answer questions to this quiz, and every question you get right, they will donate a dose of vaccine to UNICEF. Kids love doing it for that reason, and they like it because they can go up the ladder of points, and it's like a video game for them. Um, this has been so successful and now tested that the Public Health Agency of Canada is having it translated from English into French and will be available across the country in probably the latter part of 2019. And I'm sure they'd let you translate it into Spanish or Portuguese if you ask them. We also need to work as a group. You know, it saves time, it saves resources, and it adds voices and increases the credibility for what that healthcare worker is saying if all of these groups come together to say the same thing about immunization, particularly about a particular vaccine that's causing anxiety in the community. Now I'm going to shift from all those program issues you could do to what can you do for the individual patient. Well, we know that what the healthcare worker actually says to the patient and how they say it makes a huge difference to what the, the patient will decide to do about their child or about their own immunization. This is a study from Italy that came out fairly recently that showed that not having received recommendations for vaccine from their pediatrician was associated with not getting immunized. And the same thing, if they got discordant opinions on vaccination, they were less likely to be immunized. So what the important part here is, your healthcare worker needs to be seen to be trustworthy by the patient or the parent. And trust has two components to it, and I want to emphasize that. It's not just about being competent, that knowing everything you need to know about vaccines. It's also about showing that you're caring. If you come across as a robot, people are not going to listen to you. It's not about just knowing stuff. It's about how you listen to that patient and address their concerns. Vaccine refusers, this is not a debate. There is no debate. The science is clear about the benefits of vaccines and the risks of not being immunized. So do not get into a debate with a parent who refuses immunization. But one of the things that we do know is you need to inform them about their roles and responsibilities. And if you go into, again, the WHO Eurosite or the Canadian Pediatrics Society, they have those roles and responsibilities listed out there. And it is very helpful because parents often think not immunizing their children means I've not made a decision. And what you're pointing out to them is you have made a decision. You've made a decision not to immunize. And because of that, this is what you need to do. And again, it's a very helpful technique to use. Use effective parent discussion techniques. What we know is that a well-conceived message delivered poorly may not have the same impact as a poorly constructed message delivered well. So we want our healthcare worker to deliver their messages well. That's what really counts. It's not the depth and the academia they can show up. They need to be caring and they need to be competent. And it's perfectly okay for a healthcare worker to say, I'll go and look that up, that piece of information that you want. That's fine. Now, we do know that it really is important how you start talking to that parent or adult when they come in. If you come in and say, it is now time for Maria to have her immunization, that is heard very differently by a hesitant parent than if you come in and say, what would you like to do about Maria's immunizations? 
It's the first one is called presumptive. We are assuming you're going to get immunized today. I am subliminally telling you that I think this is the right thing to do, okay? Where if I come in and say, what would you like to do about this? It sounds like I think you've got a choice. I think e saying yes or no is equally good. And that's why for the hesitant, they are much more, less likely to take vaccine. 74% do it if they were presumptive, 4% accepted if you did the other. Do not do this, not a good idea. Next, if they are hesitant, you need to address their concerns. And you can do micro or mini motivational in, uh, interviewing. And there's some good references that I've got down there for you. And what is this? It's changing from talking to someone to talking with them, finding out what their concerns are, open-ended questions, listening reflectively, affirming and validating, I understand your concern is this, and then asking them if you can provide information and then verify if they understand what you've told them and then summarize. You need to use effective language. We do this all the time as healthcare providers. We need standard vocabulary. If I say something is a rare event, you likely know that's one in a thousand to one in 10,000. A parent will know what a rare stake is, but they don't know what the term rare means when we're applying it to a risk for a disease complication or for a vaccine complication. You need a consistent denominator. If I say that measles encephalitis happens in one in a thousand, and then I say, oh, but with MMR vaccine, it's less than one in a million, most parents can't do the math to know that's a thousand times less, okay? So you need to be very careful. Tell the truth. Do not hide things. Make sure you talk about the risks and the benefits fairly. Explain single event probability. You are either dead or you are not. So if you have tetanus, out of a thousand kids with tetanus, a hundred are going to die. They are not nine-tenths dead, one-tenth dead, they're all dead, okay? And people don't understand percentages when we use that. They either think they need to know you either got that complication or you didn't. You don't get a tenth of measles encephalitis. You either got measles encephalitis or you didn't. And we need to explain that properly. And please do not use terms like relative risk. Most medical students can't define relative risk for you. Why would you expect a parent to be able to do that? And I'm going to talk about the next two in a minute. Frame your message. As I said earlier, we are anxious about negatives. So it's much better to say that HPV vaccine is 99.9% .9 safe, and that's more effective than saying it has less than 0.1% serious side effects. So, you know, I don't know how many times you hear the healthcare workers say, oh, it's really safe. There's less than 1% have a problem with it. Don't do that. Do it the other way around. And this also works for programs. We know in the pandemic H1N1, there's a study that showed Sweden framed this positively and 60% of people took the vaccine. Australia framed it negatively with this way of doing it and only 18% took the vaccine. So you really need to think about what your message is doing and how it's framed. Present the concept of community protection. Don't use jargon. Roma Lipster, who was just speaking, has a great TED Talk that you can find on herd immunity. If you just Google her name and TED Talk, it'll come up. And a lot of parents find it actually helpful if that's something that they're interested in. But reinforcing the added value can be helpful, but don't do it at the expense of personal benefit. Nobody wants to protect the community without it benefiting themselves and their family as well. Okay. The other piece on this, beware of the language you use. I do not know what happens when you translate this into Spanish or, in, or uh, Portuguese, but herd immunity can cause a problem when you're talking to a parent. Herd immunity is technical jargon. It's technical words. Most parents think of herds as being goat herds or cow herds. And I actually had a mother say to me, I don't want my child to be a cow or a goat. Okay, so I don't think herd immunity is a good term to use for a lot of parents. We have another problem in English because the term herd mentality is very negative. It means unnecessary but unproven, illogical, unrealistic, and unreliable. Listen, folks, that's not how we want people thinking about community immunity. Community immunity than herd. But I don't know. Maybe in Spanish it works much better than it does in English. 
please address pain. We know that over 40% of mothers in high-income countries and low-income countries are worried about pain on immunization for their infant and young child. And it is why many of them don't show up to have it done. They may get it the first dose and then may not come back. And we can do something about that. There are evidence-based guidelines that have been accepted by WHO and recommended by WHO that are based on the Canadian guidelines that are great at done. They cover all people from neonates up to adults, and they involve physical, psychological, and pharmacological interventions. So for example, breastfeeding during immunization decreases pain. Give the most painful vaccine last. We need help from more of the manufacturers about pain on immunization, not just pain after immunization. Don't know how many people in here have had meningo B vaccine. Anybody put your hand up? It's probably the most painful vaccine I've ever had. Okay? So, you know, you, I, I, I'm not saying I wouldn't do it, but I'm just saying if you're going to do it, it needs to be the last one given at that session, not the first. Rotavirus vaccine, it should be given first because much of it contains sucrose and that decreases pain in the infant. So give the rotavirus vaccine, then give the your pentavalent vaccine. Um, the card system in schools, I'll talk about this afterwards if there's time. We, it'll be a bunch of papers that are coming out to show that school-based immunization programs, you can improve acceptance for the kids by doing a system called CARD, where they get to choose how they want to be immunized. It's about comfort. It's about asking for how they want it done. It's about teaching them relaxation and also about distraction. And they choose what card they want to play. Maternal experience in the first year of life very much affects immunization after that. So if you've decreased pain and you've made it really effective and easy for them to be immunized, they're much more likely to follow up than if you've not done all of those things. There's a new study out that just came out a couple of weeks ago on adolescents. If you have them doing exercises of their legs and arms before they're immunized, it decreases the pain on immunization and it decreases the pain and tenderness that follows after immunization in the next 24 hours. This is a freebie, guys. It doesn't cost you a penny to do this, but it works. Lastly, don't neglect the vaccine accepting group. As I said before, this group, there are some of them that do have concerns. You need to value their decisions and reinforce that they did a good thing by choosing to be immunized themselves or their family. Nurture that trust. Make sure you're caring and competent. Exploit their social networks and contagion. That parent, that teen, that pregnant woman can often be more powerful than you are in her social network in helping others decide to get immunized. They can set the social norm for nudge, okay? Grow resiliency against anti-vaccines. Whole community communication, like we talked about, where the scientists, the healthcare workers, the academics, the NGOs are all standing up and talking about the importance of immunization. Develop effective communication strategies. Listen and tailor those messages. Inoculate these people against misinformation and anti-science techniques that are going to be used. So in finishing, you know what? Immunization is wonderful. It is, as people have said over and over, an extraordinarily important contribution to our increased uh, survival and our decrease in morbidity and mortality. But if you can't get that vaccine into the arm, you didn't do a good thing. And so immunization programs really need to figure out how to not end up in disarray and how to get themselves organized so that we have community after community after community supporting immunization. Thank you.